Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Always glad to have you with us today. We are talking tech with some uh, a company that's been around for a while and a company that's uh, just getting off the ground in the last uh, year and a half, year or two. Later on, we're going to talk to Don Noakes, familiar presence in the Rhode Island business community. He's the founder and leader of Net Synergy, and they actually just moved into a new building, so we're going to hear what's going on with him. But first, I'm very pleased to be joined by Mike Melillo. He is the co-founder and CEO of Aqua sounds like Aqua, and there's a reason for that, which we're going to talk about. There, see if you'll call them like open table for boats. It's really interesting. Mike, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having us. So, Mike, we have to start with what inevitably you are constantly asked about, which is you were actually before you started this company, you were a major league baseball player. Oh well, I didn't make it all the way to the top, but I was a professional <laughs> baseball player for a short period of time, and um, it's actually what brought me to Rhode Island to begin with. So, I played summer baseball during college here for two summers in Newport, and then was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to play professionally for the Brewers organization after college. Did you did you always expect you'd get to get into, I know maybe you didn't quite as far as you wanted, but that you'd get, you'd get picked up? Yeah, you know, my father played professionally. Um, so growing up, I was always exposed to it. He also played in the minor leagues for a little bit. And I think he taught me very early on that expecting that opportunity was something that I would be uh, very sad if I, if I tried to accomplish without, yeah. you know, putting everything behind it. And, um, you know, it was very fortunate to play in a league and for a collegiate program that was around a bunch of guys that were at a skill level that helped me develop. Yeah. Um, so it was always a dream. I've got a lot of buddies that are still playing professionally and in the major leagues today, so it's fun to watch. But um, I have no regrets about where I am today. That's I can sure. imagine. So, and let's talk about where you are today. So, as I said, Dakwa, open table, which some people know what it is, where you can do restaurant reservations and things. It's kind of the same idea. But it's your company, so I'm going to let you explain it. What do you do at Docwa? How does it work? Yeah, so I think Open Table is a great parallel for, for people who are understanding of making reservations at restaurants. We do a very similar concept for the marine industry. Um, we take it a step further, and I know a prior guest that you've had, another Rhode Island entrepreneur, is Angus which upserve and we're also focused beyond the reservation aspect of it and using data to help run these businesses more efficiently but at a 50,000 foot level open table for boating is the best parallel you could have so um, how wide a geography do you cover I was looking at, at your you've, you've marinas all over the place now we do so when we launched we were just out of Newport but currently we are all the way from Canada down to the British Virgin Islands and all the way out on the west coast now up in uh, Washington as well as down in Southern California so let's say I have a boat. Yeah. I do not because I'm a journalist and we have no money. But let's say I did someday. <laughs> Maybe I'd become Brian Williams. Well, not Brian Williams, but somebody else. I, how, do, how does it work? Do I have to do I have, to have a, like a membership with Aqua? Do I just log on, get the app? How, tell me how I would go through it. Sure. So it is completely free to boaters. It does not matter if you own a boat or if you're renting a boat. If you are trying to secure dockage or a mooring at any facility on our platform, instead of calling, waiting, filling out forms, hoping for a response, you come onto our network, you load your profile, up once your information is stored securely and we're not a third-party broker in terms of we're not facilitating the reservation our technology actually is directly connecting you to the marinas that you are trying to go and visit so by going onto our platform you get exposure to all different locations that we currently serve you get price transparency which is something that didn't really exist prior to uh, our entrance in the market it wasn't intentional but a lot of our customers never had a digital presence so when you were trying to make a reservation at a participating marina you'd have to call go through the gamut of looking at different dates and we've really tried to democratize the information on both ends of the equation because if you're unfamiliar with a given area say Newport for example there's 17 different businesses within a third of a mile that take reservations and if you're not familiar with each of them and you try to come in on July 4th good luck so we really try to bring exposure to all boaters and the different opportunities that might have really ultimately trying to get more people out on the water and it, it, tell me about the as a business the yeah. revenue model is it is it fees when each time someone does it or are you working with the marinas on that you mentioned swipely so uh, maybe Angus Davis's company so yeah. it like you have some of that too. S similar model so we actually process payment there's no fee to the boater ever there's no service fee um, for all marinas you actually can join our product for free there is no cost to join and the only charge we take on each reservation we serve is the credit card processing 
processing fee. So really, we intentionally set that out of the gate to try to encourage as many people to join our network as possible. If I had 50,000 boaters in two marinas, there's very little utility to the other side of our customer base. And that's one of the unique challenges of creating a marketplace business is I not only have to focus on our marinas, but I also have to be worried about our boaters and what options they might have. So for our marina customers, they can join for free, but we also now have a paid version, a subscription software basis where if they want to unlock more tools and features to try to drive more business or create more efficiencies, they can opt into that. But effectively, everybody can join at no tax. I always like uh, hearing about like where the idea germinated from. In some ways, it seems obvious. You, yeah. you want to take a boat trip and you realize, how do I figure this out? But for specifically for you and your co-founders, where did, where did it originally come from? You said, hey, I think there's a business here. Sure. So I, I say this right out of the gate. I'm not a boater, which is the irony of this company. <laughs> um, I'm from Florida. I grew up on the water. I've been on boats my whole life, but by no means was I a hardcore cruiser. And it, it was not a... Uh, idea that generated just overnight. So there was a couple things that, that sort of led me in this direction. One was my prior company was getting relocated out to the Midwest to Omaha. And my now wife was not all that excited about relocating from the Northeast out to Omaha. So I was looking for potential job opportunities out in Palo Alto and Boston and was also consulting with a tech company on the side. I was with a couple buddies at a party one night and we were talking about what we were doing and they were mentioning how there's really nothing out there for boaters to make reservations. And I'm thinking it's 2014, how could this be yeah. possible? So as the summer dragged down, I really didn't think much of it after that. Um, I actually live on top of a marina. And one summer day when I didn't have too much going on at the office, I walked down and I met this kid who I approached and was a dock master at the local marina. And I said, hey, do you mind if I just pick your brain after work a little bit? And I think he was a bit scared at first. Uh, you know, who's a stranger coming up to me and talking to me? Um, but we met after work and grabbed a beer and I started asking a bunch of questions. And what quickly became apparent was the problem wasn't on the boater side. The problem was on the marina side. And what was happening was is that the marine industry is not like the hotel industry, where inventory is binary. You have a king-size room available or you do not. So it was very hard to create software that allowed them to run their operations as they wanted to. And as I spoke more and more with this dock master, who ended up becoming our second employee at Dockwa, um, as I, I spoke more and more, I realized the inefficiency was because they didn't have the tools. And they were running everything off of a pen and paper notebook. And while it's infinitely flexible to run off of a pen and paper notebook, <laughs> in New England, you have 100 days to make money. And if everything is being facilitated through a phone call and it's all off of one notebook in the office, you're missing, on average, seven to 10 reservations per week. And that compounds over a 10-week schedule. You have one weather event during the season. That's a massive hit to your bottom line. And what we saw the frustration was on the boater front when we started talking to a lot of our customers was they were trying to go and give these businesses their money, but they couldn't get a response as to whether or not they were going to be able to come. And the biggest challenge in the marine space is if you want to go from Newport to the vineyard, you're spending three or 400 bucks on fuel just to get there. So if you don't have a guarantee that you're going to have an assignment or a mooring, that's a lot of stress to, to you know, take on without having an actual reservation guaranteed. So I had a couple opportunities out in California and in Boston, but the deeper I dove into this, the more I realized how big of a pain it was on the marina side. So I had a couple uh, buddies, my brother-in-law, who was one of my co-founders as well, who was at HubSpot prior, and we started talking, and we, we really stole the director of engineering from HubSpot, who was a big-time <laughs> sailor, and uh, he really resonated with the concept and the ideas. He personally had experienced that pain, and it just became to the point where so many customers were telling us, if you could build X, Y, Z, we would love to have your business. So. And the rest is history. All right, we're, history. when we come back, we're going to talk more with Mike Malillo from Dacwa about his startup and tech in Rhode Island generally, and then we'll continue that conversation with Don Noakes from Net Synergy. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We are talking tech today. Later on, we're going to hear from Don Noakes from Synergy. But right now, I'm talking to Mike Malillo. He is the co-founder and CEO of Dakwa, a startup that helps uh, boaters find marina slips and, and use uh, an app to do that. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, and as we were talking about it early in the show, you actually, you played, you were in the Milwaukee Brewers organization. You were playing some pro baseball there. Uh, does, it, does that ever feed into how you approach business and entrepreneurship? Sure, every day. 
um, I think I'm biased naturally to anybody that plays sports because if you play sports, whether it's little league, high school, or professional, you've failed before. And I think that's. I actually the, only failed as a little leaguer <laughs> myself. Yeah. Uh, you look at my stats, I'm, I'm in line with that as well. Um, but it, it teaches you that you have to be honest. You have to have a self reflection of actually what you're doing. That's probably the best part about baseball. I could tell you that my swing felt great that day, but the box score says I went 0 for 4, 4 strikeouts. And baseball in particular is a game that is played every single day. It's the longest sports season that exists and it's a grind. And I think in the entrepreneurial journey that you go on, there are many days you don't want to show up. There are many days that you're just saying this is never going to work, but you have to stick to it. You got to keep coming and showing up to work every day. So I think playing sports in general at any level teaches you a lot about yourself, teaches you how to compete, and it teaches you really how to be you know, self-aware of what you need to improve upon. Another thing I'm curious about with your company, you have offices now in Newport and Cambridge, so you're seeing that thriving Boston tech scene. You're yeah. also down here in Rhode Island where there's the tech is kind of the holy grail for Rhode Island leaders in many ways. I'm curious what you think about what possibility you see down here in Rhode Island for that, for companies like yours, as well as if you think it's sustainable for a startup like yours to grow in Rhode Island. Yeah, I, so currently I would tell you that no, it's not sustainable for me to keep my business in Newport, Rhode Island. There's not enough talent that's surrounding the area Area, which is why I've been forced at a pretty early company to have two offices. That's not really normal for a startup. Um, my thoughts about tech in Rhode Island in general is, I always tell people, the distance between Palo Alto and San Francisco is the same time as it is between Boston and Providence. Yet none of the companies that ship their employees from Palo Alto to San Francisco do that from Boston to Providence. And we have transportation that could accommodate that. So I think there's an incredible opportunity. We've got Brown University, you have RISD, you've got unbelievable buildings, and you're in proximity to the second largest tech hub in the country. So I think the opportunity, there's only upside in my perspective. I think we need to get smart about attracting some of those bigger businesses, the HubSpots, the TripAdvisors, to open up satellite offices in Providence and start to ship some employees down here on a regular basis. And that's going to germinate the rest of the tech scene. I mean, I think that's what Cambridge uniquely has done and created a competitive advantage is they have so many different companies that it's a hub and they move in between each different company. So when you're trying to attract talent, I have an office in Cambridge because that's where all the engineers and marketers and sales are. So. And uh, only about a minute left, so we're yeah. taping this at the end of 2016. You're looking ahead to next year, 2017. What's next for the company? What are you excited about? Yeah, we're so focused right now on getting more marinas on the platform and adopting more of our tools. But at the end of the day, we're really trying to help boaters find more options. And I think in 2017, we're excited to be our third summer actually in business in New England, which we had a great summer last year. But we're down into Florida and the Caribbean right now. So learning about new marketplaces and taking our product on a national scale is, is something that we're excited about. Do you get to travel to all these places to, yeah. and claim it's a business trip? Yeah, that's the biggest <laughs> irony. When we started this, I thought I was going to get my summers in New England and my winters <laughs> in the Caribbean, but it's actually the opposite because nobody in New England wants to talk to you in the summer because it's their busy season, and nobody in the Caribbean wants to talk to you in the winter. So we actually spend our summers down south and our winters up north. As so often, the reality, not quite as glamorous there as you, you might assume on first plan, but it, you make it work. Mike Malillo, co-founder and CEO of Docwa, thank you for joining Thank me. You. Stick with us, though, because coming up next, we're going to talk with Don Noakes, another tech leader. He is the founder and CEO or president, I believe, of Net Synergy. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and continuing the tech conversation today, I'm very pleased to be joined now by Donald Noakes, co-founder and president of Net Synergy. And uh, I always see Don around because he's always being dragged onto these round tables as a business voice by the political <laughs> folks I cover. So I'm glad you're here with me now, Don. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's get this out of the way. To my knowledge, you, though, unlike our first guest, you were never a professional baseball player. I was never a professional <laughs> baseball player. My closest connection to baseball today, though, is that we're proudly uh, handle the IT needs of the Pawtucket Red Sox. Oh, that's that's. that's that's pretty good. That's a pretty good version of it. Um, so let's start. Tell us what you do at Net Synergy. You're in some ways you're more of a traditional tech services type of company, but explain that and also talk about how you got started because you literally have that above the garage kind of story. That's right. Basically, uh, we are we provide IT services for the small to mid-sized businesses here in Rhode Island, of which there are very many. Um, so we are not exactly in Rhode Island, a bastion of these Fortune 100s like maybe Delaware or some of these. Uh, major cities, but basically what we do is for those small mid-sized businesses that can't afford to have an on-site IT person full-time, we provide those services on a, uh, a partnering basis. A good engagement is what we like to see where we are actually become part of the team. 
So we'll go in, we'll do assessments. Uh, if we don't know the client initially, we'll find out exactly what their uh, business goals are, their objectives are. And you know, I'm a little bit from the old school, having started in this industry in 1980, where we really wanted to uh, use technology to transform a business. It's really amazing what can be done if you can really look at how a business functions and how you can then enable technology to, to make you more efficient, deliver better client services, and really provide a better um, environment for your employees. So they kind of hire you to be the IT department if they aren't going to have their own in-house IT department. Exactly. And in some cases, believe it or not, where they may have their own IT department, they'll have us come in and take care of what I call the generic technology. Mm. The technology that really doesn't matter if you're supporting a baseball team or if you're supporting an insurance company. It's still the same basic servers and storage systems and internet connectivity and security, that sort of thing. Uh, and then they can take those IT, uh, those folks that they have on staff and utilize them more for their internal uh, IT to help transition the business to help because they understand the business better they work right in the business and they can help uh, to transform the, the systems that they use to better service their clients in their particular industry well we take care of the sort of the generic things so you got into it in 1980 but you actually didn't start net synergy till 03 right 2003 yes uh, we started basically uh, Dan Charland and Peter Nelson and I had found ourselves working in an IT company that decided to go a different root. So we said, well, let's just do this together. So we were sort of a reluctant uh, president and, and uh, entrepreneur. But what we decided, we, we worked from our homes. I worked above my garage. Uh, Dan Sharon worked in his basement. And uh, we basically put the company together. Uh, really what we tried to do was bring top level engineers and technicians into our team and then basically amortize the cost among several mm -hmm. companies and then allow them to pay for that service as they needed it instead of to have a full-time person. It's interesting. I'm, you know, our, uh, Mike on the first half was sort of a classic what you'd expect a, a, a startup company, get, you know, 20, you know, young and uh, just getting off the ground. He's got an idea, he goes for it. What, you were starting, you were more mid-career when you yes. started Net Synergy. Was that nerve-wracking to be doing that or was it more like you, that gave you the, the confidence to do it? Well, it's, you know, it's funny. I was 47 years old, decided that uh, here was another company making a change. And I'm 47 years old. Now, what? fast forward 10 years, if the, my next company makes a change, what am I going to do? So I said, all right, you know, I think we need to do this ourselves and uh, be able to sort of... Uh, attack our own destiny. But the other thing uh, th that I think was, was, it was really important for us, we thought we could do it better. And that was really one of the major drivers that we had. We'd worked for companies, uh, some independently and some together, uh, the three of us, and decided that we knew a better way. And one of the things we thought was just, uh, we didn't feel like people were, took on that urgency level, that when you assign an IT company to help you, you're expecting that urgency, that mm -hmm. they're going to be there when you need them. And uh, that was one thing that um, we really tried to impart uh, immediately, was that we were there when you, we were part of your team. You could count on us. So uh, you actually just recently moved to a new building in Cranston. I believe we have a photo uh, we can show of you and most of the 45 employees that were there with you on the first morning. Uh, presumably, there it is, you can see it. I presume that's usually a sign of confidence in the future, right? Oh, absolutely. We, we felt, that we, you know, we've been, here we are, 13 years old. We started with three of us. Uh, we're at 45, 46 employees. And, and basically, um, it's been steady. It hasn't been this flash in the pan. It's been, and one of the things that both Dan and I have, have uh, really focused on is we didn't want our clients to feel our growing pains. We wanted to be able to move and grow and make sure that we did it in a logical way so that we didn't uh, impact our ability to deliver services to them. So before the show, you mentioned an ex extraordinary, I thought, statistic. Um, you estimated, uh, and you're speaking colloquially, maybe 50% of the tech industry's energy and innovation is now going to playing defense because of cybersecurity. It's really gotten that bad from where you sit. Well, not only has it gotten bad generally, but it's getting worse for the small, mid-sized business. Because, uh, of course, Target uh, received a lot of notoriety, unfortunately for them, when they were hacked basically by their HVAC system. Uh, <laughs> and, and the hackers got in, got all that information. And so what that sent shockwaves around the enterprise level clients. So they went out and they basically, the deep pockets that they have. Because yeah, we're they were, big, big companies. They are big companies. So they were able to take, and they were great targets for these hackers because they no had a lot intended. of money. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no pun intended. And so they would go in and, and uh, they set everything up. They took care of things. They, they, they took care of training their employees, which was a major uh, area that, that hackers can uh, get in through, is, uh, is 
unwitting mistakes by the mm -hmm. um, by their employees. Uh, and so they spent that money and they've really secured, they battened down the hatches, I guess to use mm -hmm. something Melillo might say. <laughs> um, but basically what they, uh, they've done, but now the small mid-sized businesses, now they have to go to that because the hackers have now focus. They say about 60% of the hacking today is, is aimed at small to mid-sized businesses. So, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people that I speak to say, well, they know I'm just a small, but man, I'm not Target. Yeah, I'm not who's Home Depot. Hack me? Hack me. Yeah. Anthem Healthcare. I don't right. have anything they want. <laughs> but in fact, what they'll do is now as they come in, they um, encrypt the data and they hold that key, that encryption key ransom uh, until you pay up. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, small businesses really feel they have no option. They don't have a lot of uh, IT people s sitting around that they can just deploy for this project. And so they'll pay up and, and just kind of keep going, doing their business. Wow. Um, so one of the other reasons, as I mentioned, I wanted to have you on is because you've, you've been a leading voice about Renown's business climate. You've, you've been talk you've talked to your, you serve on some of the committees that some of the elected officials have formed to try to get good advice. Yeah. I, we hear this constant rhetoric, making it easier business in Renown, trying to get better at that. You've been in business now 13 years as the owner. Mm -hmm. Has it gotten easier? Where do you think things stand? I, I do believe, especially, uh, I serve on the Small Business Advocacy Council with Lieutenant Governor McKee and prior to that with Lieutenant Governor Roberts, now Secretary Roberts, and um, those, they are working. They're, they're trying to get things done, and it's, it, it is good to see. But what I, it's kind of a bit of a whack-a-mole, though, issue, because you, while you have some, uh, you know, you, you think you're making some progress. We've, we've reduced the time it takes uh, to, to take to care of some of these permitting and, and some of these processes, cut down some of the actual forms and paperwork, and we're doing some more electronic things uh, to, allow to allow you to apply for permitting uh, online. So that's all happening very well. But then you'll get a, a you'll see a bill coming up uh, in Congress last year, this uh, scheduling issue where where you know employers are trying to run their businesses. They don't know what's going to happen with the weather. With the, and now there's a bill pending that says you have to guarantee a, a, you know, a, a schedule, mm -hmm. what they call predictive scheduling. So these are the kinds of things where in, on one hand you're, you're making progress, and then on the other hand you're thinking, oh, well, this is, this is a problem. Do you think it's more, is it more about regulations than, than straight taxation, the, the level of taxes? I'm, I'm sure most businesses would love lower taxes too, sure, but if you sure. had to pick. Well, I think you know, the problem is, is that they're both costly. And that's really the problem. If you have to uh, Im impose new pr procedures, if you have to have, if you have to pay for people to be on staff when you don't need them, you know, if you have all these rules and regulations uh, that come in, they may seem like just rules and regulations, but they, at the end of the day, even if you're just trying to comply with some paperwork or whatever, it, it's a cost to business. It's all a cost to business. And uh, I think we have to look at both the straight you know, taxes as well as that. I mean, there's really no reason why a state as small as we are, with the potential efficiencies that we could have, that we have such high overhead and, and so low rankings on uh, ease of doing business. But you know, we've made an investment here. All the small businesses that are based here in Rhode Island are making an investment. It's difficult for us to just pick up and, and move our business somewhere else. We need Rhode Island uh, mm. to, to get together and make sure that they're really singing from the same songbook. Uh, that we're, we're, we're looking at making things easier permitting-wise, but we're also looking at how can we reduce our, our expenses so that we can uh, re lower our, our uh, taxes as well. 20 seconds left. What are you excited about in 2017? Well, I think actually I'm, I'm very excited about the, I think the economy is going to do something. We've had, what is it, uh, we haven't gone above 3% GDP mm -hmm. in the last eight years. So I'm really looking forward to something happening on the economic side. And frankly, I think if it, if it goes really well, like we used to have these bounces and bubbles. Uh, I don't think we have enough capacity to take care of all the IT needs that we'll have in the state. All right, hopefully the boom predicted by Don Noakes comes true. <laughs> thank you, Don, for being with me, and thank you for watching this week. Remember, you can catch every episode of Executive Suite on WPRI.com.